we have to agree. Can we get started here? We have you have to agree to be recorded. Yes. So it just uh, starts. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, everyone, because I'm here in Brazil. It's 10 p.m. right now. And uh, uh would welcome everyone to the session. It's really one of the two opening sessions of the 2021 AGS conference. And uh, I would like to thanks thank everyone in the organizing committee for putting together this conference in such a short, short notice and, uh, and, and, and their adverse conditions. So we in the history of economic thought community are grateful to uh, Marianne Johnson and uh, all the other people who worked somehow to make it feasible for us to be here right now. Also, I would like to congratulate Pro Professor Cristina Marcuzzo for her distinguished fellow award, well-deserved one. You know, Professor Cristina has been an outstanding historian of economic thought over the years, a constant companion and a guiding light for us. The, all the other practitioners of this field of inquiry. And Professor Cristina has been a visiting scholar all over the world, has wrote over a hundred scientific articles, more than almost 24 books, some of them, one of them forthcoming right now. And I would, call the attention of everyone to the citation page in the AGS website, which give us uh, a, a more detailed profile of uh, Professor Cristina Marcuzzo, uh, who is honor, honorable professor at La Sapienza Università di Roma. Is that correct, Professor, yeah. professor Cristina? Yeah, it's an honor and a pleasure to share this session with you. It's my, our first time in a session. So uh, thank you for, uh, uh, for being here for your most valuable services to the field of the history of economic thought and economics in general. Okay. So uh, I guess we have a plan of time. I don't know, Rafael is, her, Rafael is here? Yeah, I'm here. Okay, pleased to meet you, Rafael. Yeah, me too. Okay, uh, I guess we we'll, we'll have 20 minutes for each one, for each presentation, and then 10 minutes for general discussion. We don't have discussions, so it will be kind of a panel. Anyone can jump in and, and make his own observations on what has been present, is being present. So let me first share, get started here and share the screen. Sure. Hope you you guys are, yes, are you guys we see it. We see it. Uh, no, that's okay. Well, this is uh, a paper which uh, I have prepared uh, a conference draft a few days ago, and uh, I asked the organization to upload it, but. You know, that's not a big problem in the abstract is that if anyone is interested, I can send through email. So it's entitled Fisher Knight and the Making of the Theory of Interest. The paper structure is provisional, it's not yet the final one, but we have an introduction, then some discussion on time preference and productive as presented in the 1907 book by Fisher, the rate of interest. Then some considerations on the shortcomings of that book and how Fisher start to think uh, of rewriting his whole theory. Section four talks about the Fisher exchanges on the manuscript of the theory of interest, 
with several economies, American economies and some foreign ones. Then the ladders between fish and night on impatience. Uh, section six talks about the theory of interest and the seventh one covers Frank Knight book review on the theory of interest and some concluding remarks. This paper was born out uh, of some visit, visits I made to the United States in 2016 and 2019 before the, the pandemic. And uh, at the opportunity, I gathered several letters from Fisher and other American foreign colleagues about the manuscript of the theory of interest and some of these economists were most outstanding ones at the time in the United States, Jacob Weiner, Harry Brown, Herbert Davenport, Henry Simmons, professor at Chicago University, Dennis Robertson, Herm Schultz, Benjamin Beckhart, professor at Columbia University, Arthur Margaret, and Frank Knight, of course. And the primary sources are the Fisher papers uh, at the Yale Archives, Knight papers at the University of Chicago, Viner papers at Princeton, and Harry Brown papers at the Missouri Historical Society. Well, uh, in 1907, Fisher published The Rate of Interest as a culmination uh, of his work on capital and income. And then he puts forward time preference of present over future goods as the main determinant of money interest rates. And got some allies such as Frank Feather who named the, this new approach as the psychological school, very much influenced by Bombaferk's Bomba work on the positive rate of interest. But Fisher introduces value as a discounted income streams, which is quite important concept within his whole theoretical structure. But he was quite ambiguous about the role of productive on interest rates. He had some strong remarks about the futility of productive in determining interest rates. And that raised a lot of concerns among uh, his fellow economists in the United States. And he used the method of successive approximations pretty much like Pareto had already done in his manual of political economy. What was Fisher's main proposition in the book about productive, especially? If you, if for some unknown reason, you have some higher productive in one line of activity, then the net income stream expected income stream will grow. And uh, as these higher values are discounted by the prevailing interest rates, the value of capital increases at the same time. So you will have more present goods, which will lower time preference, and then will force a decline in the market interest rate. That may, might be a, a long-term effect and was perhaps well in line with the classical tradition, but not everyone agreed with uh, Fisher. And in 1912, he published Elementary Principles of Economics when he tried to make his ideas uh, more widespread within academic circles in the United States. But he received a very strong reaction by Herm Seegers in 1913 who was professor uh, at Columbia University and had himself already published a book on introduction to economics. And Seeger uh, reacted by calling attention to the importance of productive in the determination of interest rates. And how would that happen? Well, uh, higher productive, if it really raises the value of capital, value if as Fisher predict the value of capital goes up then uh, given production costs the value of the return on capital instruments increases capital goods 
And then the demand for money, money capital to invest in this line of production will expand and that will translate into a higher interest rate automatically in the market. So according to Seeger's, to Seeger, Fisher was totally wrong in dismissing productive as an, a fundamental element in the determination of interest rates. But the reality is that Fisher had a, a full chapter in his previous book, his 1907 book, chapter eight, where he deals with second approximation. Uh, the chapter has almost 40 pages, comprising 10% of the book, talking about productive, but it seems that no one ha had really read that with attention. That represents the marginal rate of return on sacrifice, uh, a denomination he which make him, made him very unhappy because he thought it was somehow complicated to, to the readers to manage. Uh, he assumed also diminishing returns and the criteria, the criteria of maximum present value of investment options, which is used until nowadays in uh, investment analysis. But he wrote to his friend and former student, Harry Brown in March 10, 1928, that he expect a lot from the readers, but he, he just received criticisms and, uh, to his own theory. I made the mistake of youth in not blowing my own heart, expecting others to discover my merits and fall all over themselves and admiring them. Instead, they had they have not even read the book. That he was his main complaint against the, the critics. Because according to Fisher, economists were not aware of the method of general equilibrium employed in his rate of interest, in which time preference would equal productive and uh, the interest, market interest rate in equilibrium. And his uh, criteria, his idea of general equilibrium was that the number of variables must be equal to the number of independent equations. There is indeed a mathematical appendix to the book, but it's quite by the end of a long and drawn out book, very uh, exhaustive reading. And uh, it does not make justice to Fisher, Fisher's approach. And there uh, at the append appendix to the second approximation, one finds the ISO desirability curves and the range of, uh, of possibilities curve, the range of choice here as depicted here as a curve, ZW, and the ISO desirability curves, which he, he would rename it in the theory of interest. Section four then covers the, the main part of the paper when we examine the letters between Fisher and his colleagues. There are pretty much about 20 letters, some very brief, others longer, longer than, than the remain ones. And for instance, when talking to Jacob Weiner, Weiner had complained about income streams not contemplating uh, some other reasons than the direct consumption of goods because people may accumulate wealth for the sake of power or of running large businesses. And what was Fisher's answer? Well, he brought the meaning of his conception of gratification from income and said that, well, it encompasses anything that brings joy to people, whatever the reason. In my view, the enjoyment of paper and the prestige of wealth are all parts of the psychic income derived from the possession of material goods and enjoyments of the services of other human beings. This is a letter from July, 1929, before the theory interest was published. And there are 
other ladders with different concerns. Some, for instance, I can I would not mention all of them because it's a bit too much. But Wesley Mitchell and Harry Simons asked about the role of costs in Fisher's theory. And he replied that uh, his position on cost was that it was important as long as it was uh, estimated in future net gains or future income streams. My position is not that cost of production has no relation to the capital value, but that past cost of production has no relation to the present value of any article of wealth. Future cost of production has an influence equal in importance to expected future services. Then we come to Fisher and Knight on impatience. There are three letters between them before the publication of, and after publication of the theory of interest. Uh, one is on Fisher papers, the other is on Knight's paper. And Knight had bought on a copy of the rate of interest in 1913, uh, and he annotated that at the margins. And, and he questioned or challenged the alleged minor role attributed to product productivity in Fisher's book. And Fisher reproduced some, some parts of Knight's first letter in July 1930, 1930. And uh, that's what he said to Knight. But uh, Knight said to Fisher, sorry. But since in case of any divergence between the two arising from any cause, it must be the time preference which adjusts itself to productively through changes in the amount of saving. We are compelled to say that productive rate determines the other. Fisher was thinking about uh, the rates of return, which he assumed quite stable. And as the time preference was, according to him, more malleable, it would, in the end, have to conform to what was gained in the production uh, investments in productive investments. What was Fisher's reply to Frank Knight? Well, whatever the state of impatience, which is a new word that he devised for time preference, productive and the interest rate, the, the three variables would always coincide in equilibrium. And these variables are mutually determined in a system of general equilibrium. You cannot pick out a single one and said, oh, well, this is the main force acting to establish market interest rates. In, nine, in the 1930, then Fisher finally published the theory of interest with new wording, impatience for time preference and investment opportunities for a rate of return on sacrifice, which uh, improved a lot the, the understanding of his theory because you, you got to use what people are, are accustomed to. You cannot just go around and uh, renaming things. It will, uh, as uh, happened with the rate of interest, it creates a lot of confusion among the interpreters. But the method of general equilibrium comes to the forefront. It's now well emphasized in the, in the initial parts of the book. The chapters are shorter than you find in the rate of interest. And for me, the most important part is, is the development of the geometric method in chapters 10 and 11, which Fisher was helped a lot by Ray Westerfield, which was a, who was a professor was his colleague at the A at the time. And uh, the great innovation that Fisher saw in his book was the, the introduction of the system of equations right in the middle of the book, which was the first time in American economics that a, a book has 
system, a system of equations right in the middle of the presentation, which was formerly in a appendix to the second approximation. And this decision was, was helped very much by Henry, Ch Henry Schultz, professor at, at Chicago, who suggested him to bring his model of general equilibrium right into the middle of the book. And I will jump this quote from Fisher to advance more rapidly. And uh, then come to Frank Knight on the theory of interest. He, he wrote a book review, an extensive book review in 1931, which was developed from the letters between Knight and Fisher. And Knight argued that impatient would play a minor role in the market for loans and just in the short run, while productive or the net rate of return, would scarcely experience any change in the long run and would prevail as the ultimate, ultimate factor behind the lower or the money rate. Mutual determination does not mean parity of forces because you have a, a system with two or three variables doesn't does not mean for night that they play similar roles or equivalent roles. Another criticism by Knight, Knight was that Fisher did not present a true general equilibrium approach to the problem interest rates, which should be studied as any other price within the economy, which uh, Knight was right here because if you have investment going on, you have changes in quantities and relative prices. I'm just coming to the last slide. I guess we um, are almost over here. Uh, Knight was correct in pointing out that Fisher's theory was not really a full-blown general equilibrium model because investment decisions along the transformation curve or the range of choice curve affect relative prices and quantities. But he was wrong when assuming that rates of return were st steady because in Fisher's theory, rates of return are expected are not a physical thing, are a mental thing. And uh, as such, they can be subject to disappointment and frustration. So you would have uh, you could have a situation where rates of return would collapse because of collective psychology. So that is in briefly what I could say about my, my paper. And uh, I'll stay here, and wait for some comments, or if you have any observations or questions, please feel free. I guess I'm right on time. Okay, I'm finished here. Stop share. Yeah, I see that Ross Emmett is in the house. So very good because <laughs> I read your book with a lot of attention, Ross. Thank you. Question please or comments? I'll go ahead and ask a question, Rogerio. Um, Ross here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Good. Sure. I, um, I I don't see I don't have any particular criticisms of the argument you're making, especially since your focus is on 
uh, Fisher's views. And also, um, Knight has several theories of interest over his life. And he changed his views um, later in the 1930s uh, himself as he adopted a different kind of uh, framework. And um, so um, I, I'd, I'd have to sit down and think through what uh, Knight's later framework would say to Fisher. But um, I think you've captured the, the, uh, the debate between the two of them at this particular moment. Um, quite fine, and they have differing views um, about things at this point. Um, it's hard to call the night position you um, you show that Fisher criticizes at the end. Um, it's hard to say that that's Knight's theory of interest because um, Knight did change. So, um, um, but the focus of your research is on Fisher, so. I think it's quite appropriate that you have um, made uh, focus the argument around how Fisher responds to people like Knight and uh, and how he defends his view or slightly adapts his view over time. So um, I found the presentation quite good. I haven't had a chance to look at the paper. Thanks, Ross. Uh, I had somehow to confine the papers within some limits because, as you said, Knight went on debating the interest rate in the 30s, but uh, I just didn't have more space to, to go into that. But I'm planning to, to make a comparison between Fisher's third approximation and uh, Knight, Frank Knight's theory of uncertainty. Because there are some similar points, there are differences, but there, there are some convergence points and that would be quite interesting. And um, I'm planning to work and make a, another paper on that since they, they were uh, outstanding economists at the time. And although Fisher, he fell somehow in, in disgrace in the thirties, but when he wrote the theory of interest, he was one of the most uh, outstanding economists in the United States. So. I would uh, I would suggest uh, if you're going to look at um, Knight and Fisher again, I would look at the. This is going to sound weird, but I would look at the prefaces, the prefaces to Risk, Uncertainty, yeah. and Profit that Frank Knight wrote because in there he does tackle um, trying to tell students what his current view of interest is, um, as opposed to what his previous view was. And then of course, um, you know that there are, there's the big debate, um, especially in 1936 um, between Hayek and Knight on the theory of investment and, um, in capital and uh, the rate of interest and the and Knight's theory of, of interest at that point is very different than it is in the, the 20s. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll be careful about that. Yeah, but, but one place to look for a concise statement is actually in the prefaces that he wrote for risk, uncertainty, and profit. He wrote prefaces all the way up into uh, the late 1930s for the LSE re reprint of Risk, Uncertainty, yeah. and Profit. So if you need to get a later edition of the reprints of the LSE um, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit edition. Yeah, I was a bit sad because I could not cover all this yeah, all yeah. Material well, in it takes, one paper. It, it's, it, it takes multiple papers. It, it, uh, yeah. you, you but find I had your book to do. But I have to had your book to, to kind uh, of warm my heart. <laughs> there you go. I don't I don't have any clue whether I'm right now or not on that in, in there. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ross. And I guess we that's it. We any other question or comment? No? 
So we can proceed now with Professor Christina Marcuzzo. Please, Christina, it's Hello. your time. Um, thank you. Go ahead. First of all, let me thank you for these kind words that you made in the introduction about my award. And I am indeed very grateful to the society and I had wished to make my gratitude felt uh, in presence, but uh, I, I'm told that next year there will be a ceremony. So um, I'm looking forward to meeting you next year. And before I go on, I would like to dedicate this paper to Jeff Akut, who has just passed away. And um, I'm glad that the paper that I'm presenting is very close to his heart, since it's about two people with whom he was very much connected, namely John Robinson and, and Zrafa. I owe a lot to Jeff, both professionally and personally, and he will be sorely missed around the world, I think. I'm sure there will be occasion in which you will be remembered. And I'm looking forward to some occasion in which we can all express our esteem, gratitude, and love for, for Jeff. Okay, <clears throat> so um, let me start uh, by positing what is the question, one of the questions. Uh, that I'm addressing in this presentation. Um, I will start by something that everybody knows, or people who have worked on, on Cambridge uh, <clears throat> tradition knows, that uh, John Robinson critique uh, has always been of the concept of equilibrium, not just the um, neoclassical equilibrium. And uh, this has been something he, she has been uh, doing uh, in a different form since the early 50s. But of course, the criticism became much more to the point uh, after she discovers Rafa, and it became a dominant theme in, in the late 60s and, and early 70s. And uh, it is uh, by the early 70s that she came to present what uh, became known as the distinction between historical time and logical time. And this, she insists, this has nothing to do with alternative explanation of prices and distribution. As we know, it is instead the benchmark uh, of the criticism from the Zrafa school. And she always insisted that the point is not, uh, nothing to do with price and distribution, but has to do with the, the ability of the theory to deal with historical time and uh, uh, not to conform, not to um, take it as synonymous of logical time. And this explained why she came to believe that, uh, I think wrongly by the way, but that's another matter. She came to believe that uh, Zrafa's system uh, was vitiated because he uh, was relying on some kind of notion of equilibrium. Uh, namely the production of commodity is set in logical time following therefore some kind of equilibrium method. And this is, makes a lot of difference with Keynes, uh, who according to her is the only one possibly together with Marx who managed to deal with historical time rather than logical time. Um, Zrafa never reply, never enter in this discussion uh, with Joe Robinson, but two Zrafa followers very known, uh, Garignani and Krishna Bharadwaj, engage in a controversy with her, mostly Garignani, but also Bharadwaj, by arguing that there is a difference between uh, the equilibrium in neoclassical theories and what in the uh, Neoricardia position is called long rung position of the classical political economy. As we all know, in the neo Ricardian approach, we, we don't talk of uh, equilibrium position, but long run positions as those towards which the system, uh, as, as an attractor points uh, for, for the system. So the crux of the matter and the division, which I think is going on for quite a while between the so-called post-Keynesian, uh, both in the United States and elsewhere, and the Zrafians, uh, 
whether the long period position of the classical po uh, political economy uh, are the same thing uh, as the neoclassical equilibrium. And the point that has been argued by people following is Rafa uh, is that uh, th there is this such a difference. And the question is whether this difference has to do with changes in time as opposed to differences at the given moment of time. Okay, so if you if you if you deal with changes in time, of course you you will have to have some kind of dynamics that that explains how the system gets there. Instead, if you have uh, an approach in which you just look at difference at the point of time, then of course you don't have to specify how you get from one position to another. I think that uh, we all agree, we all know that Rafa never wrote that his production prices were attractors on market prices, nor did he describe any mechanism by which the equalization of the rate of profit was uh, realized, unlike the classical political economist in which we know that there is the capital movement that equalized the profit. Um, and uh, I think that most commentator, and certainly I do, I share the same position, is that production of commodities is a snapshot that captures the system in a given instant in time, and there is no analysis of changes in time. If you, if you, uh, there is a change in the situation, then you have another snapshot, but you don't have a dynamics to explain. This, of course, not what has been argued by people like Garignani or other, or other who maintain that Zrafa is just following the classical political economist, and therefore there is some kind of gravitation of market price towards production prices, and therefore there is a mechanism by which the equalization of the rate of profit is enforced. Why do I think that Zrafa doesn't have that? Because uh, Zrafa was very cautious to deal uh, on question relating to a change. Um, because he believes, as we will say, that when you introduce change, then you change the uh, configuration of the system and therefore you cannot be sure that things remain equal when you move from one framework to another. Uh, instead, you can certainly compare a situation at two different instant of times, but obviously, uh, like in the case of Ricardian uh, rents, you compare things that you can observe at the same time, okay? You cannot say much of things that have changed as a result of the passage of time. So I think that both Zrafa and uh, Robinson were against uh, the method of classical mechanics in economics, the idea that economics can be approached with the same method in physics. But their argument, the reason why they rejected it were different and led them to draw a very different implication. In other words, the point is that comparing to equilibrium position is not equivalent to describing the movement from one position to another. Um, you have to, if you want to describe the passage uh, from one position to another, then you have to set up some kind of behavioral assumption, what's happening in the meanwhile. Uh, and uh, Robinson was the one who insisted that when you want to describe the passage from one equilibrium to another, then you have to take into consideration expectations. And uh, the fact that in Zrafa expectations are not at all present in the analysis for her was a major region uh, of criticism and, and um, and this was something that was taken up in the debate with Garignani and Baradwaj. I think that Zrafa made a point that uh, his theory um, is, is, is as the, the format of a geometrical theory. In other words, refer to an instant in time. In geometry, we do not 
describe movement of time. You describe a situation with certain property, while a mechanical theory uh, taken from physics um, refers to process happen in real time. And when things happen in real time, then you have to introduce causality, okay? Why is something moving from A to B? What causes A to move to B and so forth? But this is something that Zrafa uh, was objecting to. He was objecting to the notion of causality in economics, at least the notion of causality uh, uh, borrowed from classical mechanics, which involve uh, uh, a nexus between time change and cause, okay? And um, why was he so much against it? Uh, and he said very clearly in his unpublished paper that, you know, all of those who have looked into them can, can check the, the reason why so very much against um, causality in the sense of classical mechanical causality, because he said uh, observed phenomena can be traced, could be traced back to a given cause, only if we could observe the forces that produce this effect. Uh, but this possibility of observing things uh, presupposes that you can go back in time and which you cannot do. And therefore, um, there is no way that you can be sure that these are the forces that cause the system to change from situation A and B. Uh, basically, is a rejection of the Ceteris Paribus clause. When you observe two uh, instant in time, um, and when you um, observe something, um, then you have to assume that you know what is going on from time A and time B. And whenever you have a time dimension, rather than a comparison of two situations at the same time, which is the, the, the difference approach, the geometrical approach, then you cannot be sure what's going on in the meanwhile. You, do, you don't have a clue. Something might have changed. Uh, since we are not dealing with infinitesimal variation as we do in classical mechanics, in real time, in, in economics, we're dealing with real time. And in time, things may happen that change the configuration of the situation. And so we cannot, we are not sure that we are comparing the same thing. And this is the reason why uh, as, uh, uh, Robinson, on other argument, not the same as Rafa, but uh, she came to the conclusion that uh, if we cannot be sure of uh, how the, you get from one equilibrium position to another, then it's better to leave that particular approach and stick to the short period uh, method. Short period is, is, is a situation in which you um, describe in a given moment of time with certain givens, and you don't assume that the short period is a path leading to some long period position because of the role of expectation, of the role of something that may happen that would move the system uh, from uh, a prescribed path, which we have in, in, in neoclassical economics, in which you move from short period to long period according to prescribed plans. And it's well known that she, she championed uh, uh, Keynes has been the one who uh, invented the short period. I don't have time to get very much into this, but it's very interesting that there is a lineage, Marshall, Kahn, and Keynes in the notion of short period, which is not as much as time interval as such, but is the nature of decision which are involved. Um, and uh, so they insist that what matters and that certain decision uh, uh, require a time horizon that's shorter than some other decision. So for instance, uh, in the short period, do you make decision about uh, the level of utilization of capacity and you don't make decision about the level of capacity because this would require um, a longer time horizon in which things may change and therefore you're not sure what's going to happen. 
So uh, as we know, the short period is defined by Keynes, a situation in which expectation generate a state of things which conform to them. So it's, it's on the basis of how what people believe things will happen, then they will behave in such a way. And so for Keynes, a short period equilibrium is a situation based on the expectation or the future level of demand. And therefore, on the basis of this expectation, uh, entrepreneur decide the level of output, which can be well below uh, full employment. And, and, and the system is stuck there because unless expectation changes, there is no way that the system can move out from, from that. And that's why uh, uh, Robinson said the Keynesian revolution destroyed the basis of long period equilibrium and put nothing in its place. Um, as I said, Robinson endorsed the, 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 the short period uh, and on the basis that there is no core uh, uh, foresight. And this is one of the reasons why you cannot be sure what will happen in the long period. And she argued that the long period presupposes that you can get rid of uncertainty and expectation. And then you, you in other words, uh, become very close to the neoclassical system in which this movement from short period to, to long period is a very smooth one. That doesn't mean that John Robinson did not work on long period. As we all know, her best known book besides the economics of imperfect competition is the accumulation of capital. And uh, of course she worked a lot on long period analysis, but she worked to show which are the stringent condition that needs to happen in order for that long period position to, to occur. So it doesn't, it is not, uh, as she said, it is not in a date in the future. Uh, she said it's an imaginary state of affair. In other words, she's setting up the compatibility, compatibility that are necessary in order for this long period equilibrium to occur. And uh, in particular, during the capital controversy, she, she argued this uh, very, very strongly. Um, she, in particular, was very critical of absence in rough of expectation, precisely for the role she attributed to expectation in the definition of Lorana equilibrium. And of course, uh, both Krishna Bharadwaj and Garignani uh, responding to her uh, that this is not the case, that is not the case that the absence of expectations in the Zraffian approach means that the Zrafa and neoclassical economics methodology is the same. First of all, because we're talking about the tendency in the case of the Zrafa long period equilibrium, but more importantly, the objection that particularly Garegnani made uh, with the role and expectation in the theory, and that comes directly from Zrafa. The idea that we should get rid of subjective, unobservable entities such as expectations. And if you want to introduce expectation, which of course we all know are part of, of the real basis uh, of economics, then we have to look at the objective basis of expectation rather than trying to model some subjective, unobservable, uncomparable um, description of expectation. And this has been particularly a point which has been exploited by Krishna Bharadwaj, in which he said, yes, okay, expectation might be useful, but let's have a look at what the objective basis of this expectation, rather than some fuzzy and, and not very... So uh, to come to the conclusion, the debate on the expectation uh, is revealing of a methodological difference that we all know between Robinson, Kahn and Keynes on one hand, and Garagnani and Baradwaj and, and Zrafian on the other. I think that the basis is that Zrafian rejected the idea that you can work, that you should be work with an observable entity, such as utility, expectation, beliefs, and particularly to treat them as if they were observable quantities and to show that you can have a perfectly consistent theory of prices and distribution without bringing this element. 
into it. On the other hand, Marshall, Kane, Kahn, and Robinson thought that you cannot exclude expectation from the analysis. The subjective element are very important to explain what's happening in the real world. And if you get rid of them, you get you throw the baby in the top top. Um, I think that this, this difference um, is a evidence that the, the sources from which they draw their analysis were very different. Zrafa obviously was following the classical political economy of Marx, while Kahn, Keynes, and even John Robinson remain throughout Marshallian as far as the basis approach. They never reject the supply and demand analysis. They, even if, of course, they were critical of some of the Marshall theory, they remain methodologically very much Marshallian. So um, this distinction between changes and difference, which is both present with Ralph and Robinson, uh, have different consequences for them. Robinson thought that we need to get rid of the concept of equilibrium itself, while for Zrafa, or for people following Zrafa, mean just abandonment neoclassical equilibrium. Uh, and I think that the, the argument is that the two concepts are very different. Uh, in, while in the neoclassical uh, case, uh, there are the well-known difficulties uh, arising from the theory of distribution. In Zrafa, there is no uh, specified path along which the system moves as if in neoclassical economics in which you move through a long supply and demand curve. And you just do an analysis comparing two different snapshots side by side without a pre-specified uh, pre, pre, um, path along which the system is said to say. So to conclude, I think there are two issues here. One, is the legitimacy of comparison of two position, whether it is leg legitimate to compare long period analysis with two position and which of the two approaches, neoclassical and uh, Zrafian are better equipped to study the movement from a position to another. John Robinson came to believe that Zraf analysis was not free from the problem because problem of any long period approach because Zrafa disregard expectation. I don't think that this is uh, an opinion that he shared, but I think that Pazinetti conclusion, I, I share Pazinetti conclusion when he said, John Robinson tried very hard to assimilate the most important proposition of production of commodity, but believe she has not quite, she has not been quite successful. So, even if she was the only one in Cambridge who tried desperately to make Zrafa compatible with Keynes, I think that she missed, she missed many points of Zrafa approach because she remained all the heartily Marcellia in her approach. Thank you. Okay. I can't hear anyone, not even the chair. Are you here? Okay. Well, <clears throat> maybe I can start with a question. Um, yes. And, and um, I guess what interests me is the um, is continuing uh, tendency to associate the classicals with the long run, um, which I remain skeptical of. The long run was an idea, it was an idea, a creation of Marshall's, and to project it back on Ricardo or Smith seems anachronistic. And I think that's a source of a lot of the confusion that Joan Robinson faced is that she was so firmly, and Keynes as well, so firmly uh, uh, entrenched in this short period, long period thinking, which in my view, Marshall made up so that he could he could fit the neoclassicals and the classicals into the same theory, given the given the neoclassicals the short run and the, the classicals the long run. But, but the idea that the classicals are associated with the long run is something Marshall made up. And I think that it, it distorts the whole discussion. 
I don't know. So maybe that's more of a comment than a question. And maybe it's too big for the 10 minutes we have here, but I'd be curious about your thoughts. Well, this distinction is certainly something that uh, uh, Marshall was very keen on. Uh, but the fact of bringing long period into the Zraffa and classical analysis is, is much more due to Garegnani than uh, Zraffa didn't say anything about it. This is just Garegnani who insisted that Zraffa is following the classical theory and that uh, you cannot have a theory unless you have a long period analysis. So there's nothing in Zraffa would uh, lead us to say. Uh, while I think the distinction short period or long period has some relevance, not as much on the length of time, but on whether you, well, which are the thing you focus uh, on the uh, spectrum of expectations. Uh, and this is something that uh, might have some relevance when you want to analyze behavior. For instance, Richard Kahn made an important contribution to try to understand why entrepreneur uh, make decision on, certain, on, level of an, on level of activity rather than uh, level, of acti or le level of capacity on the basis of the time span uh, of, of expectation. This seems to me an interesting exercise as such, but it's nothing to do with equilibrium, it has to do with the nature of expectation. And this, this can be easily accepted, no? even in Keynes, you know, short period and long period expectations might have a, an interesting uh, aspect to be explored, the distinction, I mean. But I, I agree with you that this is Garegnani who is bringing in the idea that uh, um, uh, Zrafa is following the classical in this long period position. We don't find anything in Zrafa to say this. Okay, we still have five minutes to discuss this Christina's presentation. So if anyone want, wants to make a comment, please go ahead. If I can continue the question of David. Uh, uh, your uh, interpretation of Serafian uh, theory as a snapshot, does it mean that you think that uh, this is uh, a snapshot of any uh, moment uh, in, in the system um, development, whether it is equilibrium state or disequilibrium state? No, I think that Zrafa snapshot is giving a precondition under which the system can reproduce itself on the basis of the rate of pre profit being uniform. But we are not given a specification of how the system got there. That's what the only thing, the, the snapshot doesn't tell you how, you how did you get there, but it tells you that in that configuration, the system can reproduce itself at the given rate of profit. So that's why Garegnani is insisting that uh, behind uh, Zrafa's approach, there must be some kind of classical arguments as the one we find in Ricardo and Smith, that the equalization of the rate of profit is brought about by capital movement. But this is something that we cannot, that is not specified in Zrafa. In Zrafa, we are just told this is the configuration, these are the condition under which the system can reproduce itself and, and the rate of, uh, with the uniform ones, obviously given the wage rate and so forth. Uh, but it doesn't, that's all the discussion on gravitation that uh, divided people with Garegnani and so forth. Uh, Garegnani said, yes, but how did we get there? That's the question. How did we get there? And the answer he gave is that, well, we have to borrow it from the classical political economy and so forth. And other people say, well, this may be the case, but we don't know. We are not given a clue. And of course, this is not sometimes a satisfactory answer because we want to know how this price of productions uh, are related to market prices. You know, how, how these prices will be created in the end, how that they related to market prices. This we don't find an answer in Zrafa. Uh, well, exactly. If we have a snapshot of disequilibrium state, then it is a question whether the system can be 
reproduced in this way. But the snapshot is not of a disequilibrium state. The snapshot is in a situation in which the rate of profit is uniform and the system. We are not given a snapshot of disequilibrium because if we had a snap of disequilibrium, then we, had, we would be able to know how we get to equilibrium. We have just well, as but, but, uh, short, short run equilibrium, short run equilibrium. No, we don't have it. Mm -hmm. We don't have it. We just mm -hmm. have a situation with the rate of profit is uniform, that the system can reproduce itself uh, under that particular condition, given the wage rate and so forth and, and so on. But then this is considered unsatisfactory because mm -hmm. we want to know more. How did we get there? And uh, what happens if the system moves from there to another position? But Rafa is not providing an answer. Yes, thank you. That's interesting. Isn't I, saw, the... I saw someone hands up. I guess. Richard, well, I saw Richard, but he's not there any longer. I don't know uh, who is chat. Richard was, was, uh, was raising his hand, but is not connected any longer. So, yeah, someone just left the room and I don't okay. know, any other? Uh, we still have one minute and I uh, uh, was wondering about the, if it's possible to reconcile Rafa's vision of, of the uh, economic system and the determination of prices with uh, the Keynesian one, because when you have a change in distribution, you, as Pigou has, uh, had already commented on his second condition for welfare, you might have also a change in the output. So how, how it's possible to have an opposition between uh, profits and wages, if when we change wages, for instance, we will have a, perhaps less a product or a bigger one. We, we are not sure because it depends on the on effective demand. If you could come well, on. attempts have been made, and I think that John Robinson tried desperately to make Rafa and Keynes compatible in one way or the other. And certainly Garignani did uh, by trying to extend uh, the theory of effective demand to the long period. Um, uh, and, and some others have thought that this is uh, not feasible because uh, you have to drop some assumption that in case are important, such as the relationship between interest rate and investment in order to get rid of the problem of uh, independent of uh, profit from the uh, quantity of capital. So I think that everybody wants, and that the person I think who tried more effectively, even if with some stretching some points a little bit too far is Pazinetti. Is Pazinetti the one who has tried uh, a lot to do this combination of Rafa and Keynes, Keynes for the short period and Rafa so-called for the long period. Um, not everybody is very satisfied with, with, with this result, but that's, that's how we stand. I think that uh, the best we can do is to try to deal with pro rather than trying to have one unified theory that explain everything to try to work with pieces of theory applied to particular okay, problems. Yeah. And that's, uh, then you can have Kaleski, then you can have not just Rafa and, and, Rob and, and Keynes, but also Kaleski and, and others. So I think the, the, the idea is, uh, is uh, to have uh, the uh, problem uh, addressed. Um, approach in a way that are not in a general yeah. complete uh, approach yeah good answer yeah very good thank you christina for the presentation we are right on time now for rafael's uh, work on frank knight and common sense so rafael there you go it's your turn please thank you i'm just sharing my slides here, I guess everyone can hear and see. Okay. Okay, so um, thank you very much for your two presentations. Uh, mind, uh, I renamed it uh, slightly Common Sense, a key to Frank, Knight, uh, Frank Knight's epistemology and ethics. 
uh, to be a bit more specific about the content of uh, the presentation. So uh, why should we, uh, should we look at uh, the concept of common sense in Frank Knight's writing? Uh, because Frank Knight has uh, insisted on the, the importance of uh, intelligence uh, in society and uh, in the democratic political system. And he has regularly complained that, uh, well, citizens were just not intelligent enough. And uh, so this insistence on intelligence could make us forget uh, the importance of common sense in his writings. And um, uh, the fact that intelligence is uh, most likely a mix of common sense and uh, scientific uh, knowledge. Um, so uh, I base myself mostly on uh, Knight's writings in the 1920s, where a common sense regularly appears as an epistemological basis of uh, Frank Knight's pluralism. And uh, there is also Hans who mentioned that uh, for Knight, economics was a common sense science. So I'll, maybe it will be a bit, a bit clear what it means. Uh, but the horizon of, um, of this project is to check the hypothesis uh, that common sense can play the role of a, of a unifying principle uh, in the context of Knight's uh, ontological and theoretical pluralism, uh, some kind of a principle that would replace the idea of a general theory, and uh, that's a good way to jump from uh, Christina's um, conclusion. Uh, that, uh, but this uh, principle would somehow remain uh, always uh, indeterminate. And um, beyond night, I think uh, it's interesting to look at common sense because it appears to be uh, a concept that uh, shows up in different contexts as alternatives to different kinds of positivism. And so, for example, uh, John Coates in uh, the claims of common sense mentions that at Cambridge, Keynes uh, used common sense against logical positivism. And Keynes stated that a certain amount of vagueness actually was more efficient in communication uh, than uh, trying to find the perfect uh, logical um, a speech or language. And I think we can even relate this thing to Frank Knight's uh, own thinking, because for Frank Knight, uh, communication always involves a good deal of interpretation and uh, even some kind of poetry. So I think we can relate maybe those, those forms of uh, common sense against different kinds of positivism. And so the concept of common sense appears uh, quite early in Knight's writing, uh, already in the methodological uh, part of risk, uncertainty, and profit. And the first thing he tells us is that uh, common sense is a uh, superficial knowledge forced upon intelligence by direct contact with the world. And so here appears this uh, theme of intelligence as the active force of uh, human nature. But slightly uh, after, he mentions that our common sense generalization have a very high degree of certainty in some fields, giving us in regard to the external world, for, ex for instance, the axioms of mathematics. And most import importantly, uh, Knight almost equates common sense and intuition uh, regarding uh, our knowledge of ourselves of ourselves as individuals and uh, as uh, human beings. And so uh, he says that our knowledge of ourselves is, I can show you my screen, please, is based on introspective observation, but is so direct that it may be called intuitive. So here we see that there is some relevance of common sense. And the question is how does it articulate with uh, scientific knowledge and uh, intelligence. 
Uh, as for uh, the definition of intelligence, uh, I could not find any clear definition in Knight's writing. Maybe if someone has a hint, um, uh, uh, that would be welcome. But uh, Knight often mentions uh, the book by Dewey and uh, his colleagues, the 1917 uh, book named Creative Intelligence, where Dewey um, considers intelligence as a creative form of uh, for finding uh, solutions to uh, social uh, problems. So there is really this dimension of uh, creativity and intelligence. And so the question is, uh, why aren't science and intelligence enough? Why do we need common sense? And I would like to introduce this question with a, um, with a quote that I, I think illustrates uh, quite well Knight's, um, Knight's argument. He says that the bias for monism that exists, I take it in all minds, leads some to argue that there is a complete causal system in the facts of stimulus and response alone. But the position is intolerably repugnant to common sense, which after all has the last word. So this is in one of the, of the texts published uh, by Russ Emmett in 2011 in uh, Frank Knight in Iowa City. And so of course the adversary here in this quote are uh, behaviorists. And so this relates to uh, Frank Knight's anti-positivism, anti which is a, a quite a, a topic uh, quite already addressed in the literature. But I think uh, uh, going back to uh, the clash of common sense and scientific logic, uh, for example, in uh, economic psychology and the value problem, uh, Knight's uh, 1925 article uh, can give us a better grasp of this anti-positivism. And uh, so in this text, he illustrates, illustrates the, the clash between common sense and the scientific logic. And he says that philosophy needs to arbitrate this, this clash uh, because uh, or else common sense is just going to win because common sense always does what is convenient for, for him or it. And so what is the problem is that scientific uh, logic is deterministic, it's monistic and it's static. And common sense on the opposite uh, tell us that uh, with regard to human nature, because the clash in fact happens uh, when, the, when human nature is involved. Scientific logic is uh, very uh, useful to address uh, um, natural phenomena, but once we try to, to use scientific logic to address human phenomena, then it meets uh, common sense on its way. And so the main problem is that uh, the scientific logic denies the reality of the mind, and it denies the reality of uh, other minds. And for Knight, uh, this is the primary common sense uh, knowledge that we have is that we do have a mind. And the second thing we do know is that other people have minds. And of course, this is a, a thing that cannot be observed, the mind of the others. And this is why, uh, because it cannot be observed, it, it cannot, it's not something that can be drawn from a scientific logic of observation or uh, mechanism. Um, so uh, this is not only scientific logic that is problematic here. Uh, it's also uh, other kinds of logic like uh, metaphysics. So Knight compares the two logics of physics and metaphysics and says that both try to deny some fundamental aspect of reality. One is trying to deny the reality of the mind and the other is trying to deny the reality of um, external phenomena. Um, and so the conclusion of this clash is that common sense is closer to the ultimate and inclusive facts of experience. And this is an important argument because uh, in those years in America, experience seemed to be really the, the main uh, ultimate data, data 
uh, that we could rely on. And this is related to uh, also the pragmatist philosophy and uh, uh, William James's uh, radical empiricism. So uh, the thing is that uh, science is static. It takes uh, some kind of a picture of the world uh, and uh, assumes causality, but common sense has all the dynamic power on its side, uh, the creative power of nature. Uh, and so for night, uh, nature is not really, or, or cannot be uh, assumed to be this monistic old with um, eternal laws. And so uh, the conclusion is that for night, uh, we have to come back to the position of common sense, that what we are irresistibly compelled to think of as real and treat as real is real, in the only meaning that the world can have for such minds as ours. And uh, the logical conclusion that we have to be dualists and pluralists. So this leads us to Knight's uh, pluralism and common sense as an epistemological basis of Knight's pluralism. And Knight states that there is an ineradicable element of irrationality and ultimate pluralism in the world. And as I said, this is uh, related to uh, the fact that we are torn between body and mind. And uh, Knight takes care to oppose his view to what he calls the naive uh, dualism of the plain man. And he also says that uh, Walter Lippmann uh, holds this naive view of just two different worlds, one uh, natural mechanical and one of the mind, uh, that these are two separate universes. But for Knight, this, this is more complex because our apprehension of the external world is uh, largely related to our metaphysical world. And uh, we learn how to observe reality through our metaphysical world, which is largely a product of communication uh, and education. And the second element of um, um, ultimate pluralism in the world is that uh, we are torn between determinism and freedom. And again, uh, Knight considers uh, the mind as the cause of our actions because the mind generates a purpose and uh, ethics. And so uh, our actions are directed by our purposes. So this explains further why uh, Hans calls uh, Knight's economics as a common sense science because Knight considers economics as only the means and efficiency science uh, because we have a purpose that arises from our minds and we are going to try to reach it, uh, reach, uh, reach it as efficiently as we can. But uh, we are not only uh, rational beings at all. And so this leads us to uh, the six categories that hands and heart have uh, discussed. Uh, so uh, for Knight, there are three um, naturalistic categories, which are the physical, uh, the biological, and also the cultural uh, dimensions of human beings, cultural only as spontaneous uh, cultural evolution. And this can be uh, addressed by uh, uh, positivistic uh, scientific methods. But uh, above this, there are the purposive and problem-solving sides of human beings, which uh, are the uh, economic side, uh, but most importantly, uh, the value side. Um, so I'm going to talk about the value side. Um, so for him, since we have a, metha a metaphysical world, um, uh, we also have values in this metaphysical world, and those values are not related to something outside or something physical in us. This is really a field, a metaphysical field in itself. And uh, those values are subject to our individual criticisms, but also uh, the social uh, criticism. Uh, 
So the definition and criticism of value is both an individual and social process. And so it leads us to uh, the second aspect of uh, common sense, uh, because Knight will use common sense against logic uh, in, a, in a way very close to that uh, which he, he used against, uh, I mean, in the epistemological field, he will use it in the value field. And there is a nice uh, writing, which is called Empower the Invincible Logic of Ascetism, where Knight writes that uh, he wants to contrast the invincible logic of ascetism with the equally invincible logic of Spencer and Carver, proving that value is a matter of intelligently directed activity, intelligently in a social sense. So what will Knight do in this text? He will uh, use common sense both against, against uh, the logic of hedonism, which he, uh, he attacks uh, in his writing about uh, science uh, and the scientific logic. And so uh, according to the scientific logic, uh, um, hedonism is in fact a scientific ethics, but uh, Knight's other adversary is a, a religion. And he will also use common sense to tackle the logic of ascetism. And so where the uh, scientific uh, logic leads to hedonism by stating that we are only desiring machines and that value is only related to our desires, uh, the Christian ethics uh, does exactly the opposite. It says that basically the universe uh, is immoral if we, are, we do not have equal power to reach value. Since we do not have equal power to reach value, then uh, everything that is worldly is, uh, is wrong. And so the only thing that is uh, valuable is our own uh, mind. And so, um, so the two logics are two extremes, in fact, for Knight. And so he will use common sense against the logic of, um, no. Uh, he will use uh, common sense to keep some kind of ascetism because uh, he says that, yes, uh, power is unequally distributed in the world, but one possibility to deal with that is that we value some ascetism because if we don't, we all want the same thing and this is not possible. So we have to have ascetic values because uh, or else we cannot um, distribute value in an intelligent way. But uh, this is not enough because uh, if it's only ascetism, then we are back to the Christian uh, logic. So he also says that no philosophy or logic that common sense can accept will support the conclusion that people are equal in their equipment for the pursuit of the real values of life. And um, uh, after, he says that the argument that power is not requisite to the good life is quite too convenient for the people who have the power and rejoice in the conservative attitude. So he uses common sense also in a way to revolt against uh, the status quo uh, distribution of power. Uh, so this, this is really typical of Knight's position, which is in between conservatism and radicalism. I think something that has been well shown by uh, Berg, in Bergen's uh, article, uh, Frank Knight's Radical Conservatism. So now I would like, uh, after comparing uh, the role of common sense in epistemology and in ethics, to go back to uh, the famous quote of the common sense indi individual where Knight writes, the chief thing which the common sense individual actually wants is not satisfaction for the ones which he has, but more and better ones. This is a well-known uh, part, but I think uh, what follows is a bit um, overlooked. He says, a sounder culture leads to a form of tolerance very different from the notion that one taste or judgment is as good as another that the fact of preference is ultimately all there is to the question of wants. So now that we have explored uh, common sense, 
maybe it can be clear what the common sense individual is and even more precisely what the cultured common sense individual is. Because if uh, we consider uh, science as a form of culture, uh, which I think um, uh, enters the Knightian fr framework uh, quite well, then um, the common sense individual is the one who can be uh, tolerant, but also critical in the field of value and can use a science in this process of uh, criticism. So to conclude, uh, uh, we have seen that common sense is uh, the epistemological ground of uh, uh, ontological and theoretical pluralism and common sense as judgment and attitude toward the creation and repartition of values. It is some kind of ethics. And so I would like to ask you to conclude, maybe if we can discuss that amongst other things, uh, can common sense be this kind of uh, indeterminate principle uh, that uh, acts as a unifying uh, uh, way to use uh, different uh, scientific theories uh, to address the, 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 the scientific and value problems. Thank you very much. Maybe I'll remove the PowerPoints. Uh, we can't hear you, or at least I can't. I was uh, uh, waiting to see if others wanted to jump in before I did, since uh, obviously I'll, I'll probably want to comment on this. Let me say a couple things and make sure I leave space for others. Um, one, um, very, very good and very interesting presentation. And I would uh, love to, um, uh, I, I didn't have a copy of a paper beforehand, so I'd, I'd love for you to send me a copy of whatever you're working on uh, on this. It's uh, quite, uh, I, I really like the way you presented it. And I've discussed the connections between night and common sense um, views, uh, ethics um, with several other scholars over the years. And um, it's not something I have been steeped in. so. Um, although I would say probably I have, probably I have, just haven't realized it. So uh, it, it's good to uh, to know. I thought I might um, say um, a couple specific things. First, thank you very much for uh, using all the material I made available from Knight's unpublished writings in the 1920s, which I can tell you've made uh, very extensive use of and which are, um, as you say, very important to understanding Knight's work. And that's why I tried to just make it all available because it's um, a vast quantity of material um, that is relevant to several parts of Knight's work. Um, and um, I wanted to point out to you, and maybe it's something that you would have an interest in picking up um, between the twenties and the 30s and 40s, Knight makes a number of lists of the uh, different categories of knowledge or different categories of, um, of what we can know. And they range, uh, I think here in your presentation, you used a categorization, which was um, like three, three things. But um, he has categorizings that go up to seven, six or seven things. And it would be interesting to see um, how you see his, is it an evolution of his thought or is it really just 
recategorizing things? Um, how does it connect back to this common sense foundation, et cetera? Um, and he really goes over time, he, he creates various lists. And I think I've documented that somewhere, but um, uh, it was a long time ago now. Um, and then the last thing um, I wanted to say at this point um, is so that others can make comments. Um, it seems to me that a lot of Knight's focus on these common sense themes comes to a conclusion when he reads Max Weber and, um, and when he translates Weber. And after the 1930s, he spends the rest of his career trying to write a book that only has three categories, but they are ethics, economics, and politics, um, or society, however you want. And, um, and it'd be interesting to trace, which something I had always wanted to do but never did, trace uh, the continuities and discontinuities between what Knight starts with, the material you're, you're uh, very nicely have summarized, um, to the arguments he makes um, for a pluralism, um, in, but really an ethics um, uh, um, social politics and societal concerns and economics and the independence of those things. Uh, which I think is a theme that comes through in this common sense theme is don't try to make everything and try to make one thing into everything. Uh, let it be something that we use, but it's not everything. And he keeps playing with that theme. So I'll shut up and let other people make comments and you as well. Uh, yeah, thank you very much for your comment. And uh, indeed uh, those uh those texts that uh, you published were very precious. And uh, um, these, these are texts that were not in the open debates. And so we have a clear idea of what Knight is really thinking of and um, all the things he has to struggle with in the same time, uh, science, religion. And, um, and so uh, this thing on the categories, uh, yes, um, I only read the categories that um, others have um, tried to you know, make or uh, distinguish. Um, but um, probably that the three last categories, I, I don't know, but yeah, it's a way to synthesize the, the main problems, uh, ethics, economics. Economics is how to reach values. Um, Ethics in maybe is maybe how we discuss values or act according to values, and the political side is uh, uh, how we do that uh, at the uh, at the level of uh, the whole society. And um, I don't know uh, really yet about all this, uh, except that it's really really interesting. Uh, but there is another distinction that I would like to uh, inquire is between the social and the political too. Because uh, Knight was very pessimistic uh, in the political uh, field. But I think if we relate what he says about communication, uh, which, hap which happens in the, the political field, but also in the social field, that there is something uh, um, that is uh, under politics, and that is the discussion discussions we have um, all the time. Uh, this discussion also um, takes part in uh, the definition of values. And um, I think it would be interesting maybe uh, to check whether if Knight is not uh, as pessimistic uh, in the social field as in the political field. I don't know, but uh, sometimes Knight's pessimism is uh, hard to take <laughs> and so i'm trying to find some um, some uh, some hope <laughs> maybe in the social field <laughs> i don't think he offers much hope but uh, but at the same time he seems to have hope generally so um, but 
Yeah. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Rafa, uh, do you have the, the, your reflections in, in the form of a paper already or still a work in progress? Yes, uh, well, it's not, uh, it, it's in between both, but uh, it was not uh, quite finished. Uh, so I didn't made it, uh, make it available, but um, it's almost finished. So um, yeah, but I think uh, I will have to work on it uh, more until it's okay. really, I can say it's really finished. Yeah, because I, I can see uh, how Knight was against Fisher's idea of time preference as a universal principle of human behavior from your thoughts that you have presented here, especially uh, I can't hear. Connection is bad. Yeah. Oh, well, Rogerio, yes. Are you guys hearing me? Yes, yes. now, yes. Now, yes. Oh, okay. Well, time is up, so I'll have to. Thank, thanks, everybody, for coming and invite you all for the upcoming sessions after. The coffee meeting in our own house. There is there's not a place for for our, uh, our getting together. So thank you everybody and see you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank bye. You. bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you for hosting.